And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And we shared last time that that word replenish, according to Strong's Concordance, is not to replenish something that, that had been depleted, but it means to fill to the full. So he says, Be fruitful and multiply and fill to the full the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And the Lord, when I was reading this, when the Lord began to speak to my heart, He said, I want you to notice here in verse 26, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Yes. And then He goes on for the purpose. He's sharing the purpose of them being created. Then in verse 27, and God created man in His own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Notice in verse 27 that he only created them in his image. He did not create them in his likeness. There's a difference here in God creating man in his image and in his likeness. <laughs> Brother Ray, I had just always just read that and just connected them together in his image and likeness. They're one in the same thing. But it's not really one in the same thing. Because if it had been, why put double words in there for the same meaning? But when God created man, He created man in His image. And in verse 27 says, He created us in His image. Male and female, He created us in His image. But it didn't say one thing about in His likeness. Verse 27, it says nothing about Him creating us in His likeness. And... The Lord began to talk to my heart that, you know, when a person is born, you know, you, we see, uh, you know, little boys, you know, or, or little girls, and we say, boy, I tell you, that little boy is the spitting image of his daddy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many heard of that? Yeah. Yeah. Now, spitting, spitting, not spitting image, but the spitting image. <laughs> Southern talk. <laughs> what we're meaning there is the fact that he has features like his father. He has eyes like his father. His builds like his father. We're actually talking about a physical appearance. Isn't that right? Yes. 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 So therefore, a person is born, when they're born, they're born in the image of their parents. Yes. yes. Or, you know, or in the image of a human being. Isn't that right? Yes. But if they're really like if they're really like their parents, then we'll say, boy, they're in the spitting image. But how many know that that boy, that son, or that daughter can be the spitting image of that father and still not be like his father? That's right. So the image, when God created man in his image, he did not create him in his likeness. He created him in his image, and then he had to make him into his likeness. That's right. That's a process. Yes. And God, he said, let us create man in our in our image. And so when he created him, he created him as, in his image. But him, you know, it was a process that God had to do to bring Adam into his likeness. Yes. To be like God. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so therefore, to be like God, we go on down to verse 28, and it says, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. So what God was wanting man to be was not just in his image, but he wanted one in his... Likeness. Help me preach. Likeness. Likeness. Yeah. <clears throat> a process. Yeah. But see... Just because a person has dominion, just because a person is given authority, 
Just because a person is given the rulership or the dominion over something does, still does not make him in the likeness of his father. Right. Yeah. right. I mean, a father can have that son and, and he can... Uh, that, and that son can be the spitting image of his father. Then that son can grow up and he can turn his business over to his son... And the son can rule and reign over his business or run the business and all this. But it still does not mean that that son is like his father. Amen. Let me know that very seldom the son is like the father. Yeah. Usually when a business is passed to the second generation and especially the third generation, the likeness of the original characteristics of that company have totally been gone. Amen. 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 Right. So therefore, God did not want man to just be in his likeness and authority and dominion. He really and truly wanted man to be in his likeness in characteristics, yes. in mannerisms, in his nature. Yes. And so when God created man in his image, then he started developing him in his likeness and have you know that in his likeness means, you know, you can say, boy, that boy is just like his daddy. Now you've changed it. You're not saying he's in the spitting image of his daddy. Now you're saying his behavior is just like his daddy. His mannerisms is just like his daddy. But you know what? He didn't become like his daddy when he was born. He became like his daddy at, in a process of time. Isn't that right? Yes. So God was in the process of making Adam and Eve in his likeness. They were already in his image. But him and no, the enemy came and destroyed the whole thing. Yes. Before Adam and Eve ever got to the place where they were like God, Satan came in and offered them a shortcut. Now if you will eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then you will be what? Like God. He didn't say you'll be in the image of God. He said you'll be in His likeness. You'll be like God. Satan offered them a shortcut to eat the tree of knowledge of what to do and what not to do. And he said now you can be like God in your own abilities and by your own reasoning and your own capacity to do so. Yeah. And you know what? Ever since then, man has tried to be like God. I mean, they take on religious forms. Y'all still here? And they go to church. And they pay their tithes. And they try to rule over their family with their iron fist. Try to have dominion. I know y'all don't need this. That other crowd does, but they're not here. <laughs> but man, when he sinned, he lost the image and he sure lost the likeness of God. Because Satan offered him an alternative. And you know, when man ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know, it did not make them like God. In fact, it reversed the thing and man lost the image of God, even lost what God was all about and man fell into darkness because of sin and his enlightenment, his mind became darkened and his understanding became darkened and so therefore he lost what God had created him to be and what he should have been to start with. Amen. Isn't that right? Yes. So then, rather than man being in the likeness of his father God, then man began to take on the nature of Satan himself. Yeah. And we know that God is love. The first thing we see after the fall is hate in Cain killing his brother. Yeah. Envy, strife, contention, no patience, intolerance. Self-centeredness. Yeah. All of the characteristics of Satan's nature, man lost the image of God and the likeness of God and began to put on the image and the likeness of his father, Satan, when he had been born of Satan's spirit. Yeah. Right. Isn't that right? Yes. So what's going on in the world today, 
what went on in the world when Adam fell and when Eve fell and they tried to take the shortcut that Satan offered them, then what happened was, was they took on the image and likeness of their father Satan. And so all those years man had lost and he had no idea what the image of God was. Even in the Old Testament, God, man's image or perception of who God was and what God was, was was power and might and judgment. Yeah. 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 So he only saw God as a tyrant wanting to dominate and rule over mankind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is not like God. Right. In fact, I was raised and I was, you know, I, I had the concept when I got saved that the God of the Old Testament was fire and brimstone out of heaven against everybody that messed up one time. Zap, you're gone. <laughs> God don't tolerate nothing. You saying you're dead. I mean, that's what it sounds like in the Bible. If you just read what the parts that people point out to you. Isn't that right? Man had the wrong image of God and he had the wrong likeness of God. So therefore man didn't know what God was or who God was or what he was like. But God wanted to prove. And let's go to Exodus now, chapter 33. And let's find out really and truly what God is like. The very nature, the very characteristics. Exodus 34. While you're turning there in Exodus 33, we know that Moses... In Exodus 33, God told Moses to put the tabernacle outside of the camp. And when Moses put the tabernacle outside the camp, then he went outside the camp to talk to God. When he got out there, the Bible says that God came down in a cloud. The cloud came down and God was in the cloud. And he talked to Moses face to face yes. as a man talking to his friend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing is, is, Moses said, God, show me thy... No, not first. Show me thy, in verse 33, show me thy ways. I want to know how you do things. So God began to show Moses his ways. And Moses, I mean, I believe that God showed Moses ways because Moses asked him to show him his ways. Show me how you do things. And God showed Moses how he did things. But then when God got through showing Moses how he did things, you say, how do you know that? Wait just a minute and we'll get into that. But uh, uh, what God did when he got through showing God showing Moses his ways, that did not satisfy Moses. He goes on a little bit further and he said, Now God, show me thy what? Glory. Yeah. Show me thy what? Glory. Glory. Now what is that? Nature. What is his? He wasn't, Moses wasn't wanting to see God's body. We went into this last time, and I know Brother Dave and this girl has been through this many times also. God, Moses was not interested in seeing God's image. Right. He was not look in, interested in seeing God's body. Yeah. That was not what Moses was looking for. He wanted to see God's what? Glory. Come on, help me out. He wanted to see God's what? Glory. Glory. And when he wanted to see God's glory, he was not wanting to see a... Now the church has concepts of what glory is and ideas of glory. You know, it's that cloud that comes down and, and it's kind of got this bluish, purplish glow in it. And, you know, it's called Shekinah. And, you know, I was shocked when I found out that wasn't in the Bible, but... <laughs> Shekinah glory is not in the Bible, but glory is in there. But we have this concept of what glory is. But Moses said, show me thy glory. Let's go now to verse uh, chapter 34. And we'll find out just what God's glory is. Sister Barbara, if you'll start reading in verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, giving iniquity and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. 
what God was saying right here when Moses said, God, show me thy glory. Then as God put Moses in the cliff to the rock and he moved his hand, he said, you will not see my face, or no man can see my face and live. I will show you my hinder parts. As I go by, I will show you my what? Glory. <coughs> and uh, we got into this last time. I don't want to get hung up right here, but God, Moses, God was not telling Moses, I'm going to show you the back of my head and my back and my buttocks and the back of my legs. That's not what God was saying. I'm going to show you. Right. And it was not his face that he wasn't going to show him as far as the natural features because the Bible had just said in verse 33 that Moses talked to God, what? Face to face. So now in verse, in chapter, you know, a little bit further on in chapter 33, then God says, you can't see my face. I thought he just talked to God face to face. But really and truly, when they get down, it's a figure of speech that we talked about last time. That is the fact when Moses talked to God face to face, it meant that they were open with one another as a friend, as a man speaking to his friend. Very yeah. openness. Yes. Yeah. And it's just like when you face somebody with an issue, I don't mean you put their, you, your face in that issue, does it? It means you confront it, you, you face it, you, you, you have openness with that. Well, when God was telling Moses, I'll show you my hinder part, he was saying, Moses, I'm going to pro And then when he passed by, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, we're going somewhere with this. I know this is common knowledge right here, but we're going to get in some good stuff here in a little bit. Look at your neighbor and say, we're getting in some good stuff. <laughs> And so therefore, as God passed by, He proclaimed His name. What did He proclaim? Read it again. And the Lord passed by before Him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilt. All right, right there. So when he passed by, he proclaimed his name. He showed Moses who he really was. <coughs> we talked about this earlier last year. You know, just like there's a, a name means things. You know, like Procter and Gamble. What does Procter and Gamble mean? It stands for products. All different kinds of products. They have what? <laughs> so pretty. <so. laughs> And different kinds of products. Isn't that right? So God, when He proclaimed His name, He was proclaiming really and truly who He was and what He was by His very nature and characteristics. Yeah. The glory, if you look up glory, you can do this yourself. I'm not a, a scholar. I just got a strong concordance and electrical age. And when you look up the word glory, in the Old Testament it means heavy or weighty or, or very rich in what He is. So when he talks about mercy and grace and long-suffering, that means he is very rich in all of this. He's loaded with it. Amen. Yeah. So therefore, when God passed by and showed this, then what he was really doing, how can you show somebody your mercy and your grace and your long-suffering and all this just by passing by them? You can't see that in somebody passing by, can you? So what God did is he put Moses in the cliffs of the rock and him know that God went back and started at the beginning and began to proclaim and show Moses through the fall of Adam all the way through all the generations how that he was merciful, he was long-suffering with mankind, he was patient with them, he forgave iniquity. So he was, as he was going back in history, he proclaimed to Moses and showed to Moses exactly his very nature and characteristic and showed Moses what God was really like. The word glory... The definition of the word glory is to recognize a person or a thing for what it really is by its very nature. Yes. Did you get that? Yes. It is to recognize a person or a thing not because of its figure, not because of its image, but because of its very what? Nature. nature. And so God, Moses wanted to know God not after an image, not after a body, but he wanted to know God by his very what? Nature. Nature. I want to, when I, when I see you, when I know you, God, when I see a nature, I want to know if it's your nature or not. Let me know the world is looking for the same thing today. Yes. So when Moses, when God passed by, he proclaimed his very nature 
to mankind and he revealed it to Moses and then Moses put it in the book and it was so everybody could know the nature of God. And now, now we know from the scriptures that God is not just judgment. Huh? Ready to zap us. Ready to wipe you out. I guess it's getting too warm in here or my message sure is boring. People get to <laughs> Shake yourself. <laughs> now, nah, just give me y'all. But what happened was, was God had to proclaim His nature to mankind. And so Moses, from then on, if you'll notice immediately when God showed Moses His nature, was the children of Israel was in a mess. Yeah. God had already left them and he was outside the camp. But when Moses found out the nature of God, he ran and fell down at Moses at God, Moses God's feet and told him, God, he said, now Moses, now God, if you since you're all of this, we need your nature right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we need who you really are right now. Do you know that we all know that God is what? Love? God is a Savior. He saves from sin. He saves from destruction. He is a Savior. Yes. He is a Deliverer. Yes. He is a Forgiver. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. He is a Healer. Yes. But all of this was in God... And it was the very nature of God to do this. We're going somewhere, like Brother Dave said. All of this was the very nature of God Himself. But heaven know God needed some way to manifest that. Yes. yes. How can you ever reveal yourself, your nature as a Savior, unless somebody is lost? That's right. Yeah. How can you ever forgive anybody of sins to manifest that nature of forgiveness if nobody is ever going to sin? That's right. How are you ever going to reveal healing to someone if nobody's ever going to get sick? Right. So when we see that Satan and what Satan does, everything that he does is only an opportunity for God to reveal his nature through that situation. Yes. I mean, when man sinned, it was only an opportunity for God to reveal and say, Hey, I am, I am heavy in Savior. I am literally just absolutely busting at the seams with, with the saving nature. But he didn't have anybody to save. I, I'm just bubbling over with mercy and forgiveness, but I have nobody to forgive. I mean, the hardest thing in the world is when you're rich in something and you can't share it with anybody. Then when man sinned, God didn't say, oh my God, what are we going to do now? When man sinned, God jumps up and he said, Hey, let me tell you what I got in store. I'm going to now have the opportunity to reveal my saving nature to mankind. I'm going to be able to reveal who I really am as a what? Savior. I'm going to really be able to reveal myself as a forgiver. I'm going to be able now to actually manifest my long suffering with mankind. Yes. So whatever the devil does is only an opportunity for God to reveal who he really is on the inside. Oh, I wish I could just jump to the end right here. Oh, that's kind of where we're going at the end. But we need the middle before we get to the end. Isn't that right? And so God is loaded. He is heavy. With all of this forgiveness and mercy and long suffering and, and Savior and healer and all this. And when the devil comes in, the Bible says that Satan, he's only the, 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 the instrument that blows the coals. <laughs> he's only the one that opposes God and creates this, I mean, he starts this evil stuff. And the only thing the evil does is give God an opportunity to manifest the good. Oh, hallelujah. He told, he told Pharaoh, he said, Pharaoh, I created you so you would oppose me and resist me so I could turn around and show my power and also my mercy and my forgiveness and my deliverance. Everything you do, I say, well, is going to be an opportunity for me to manifest myself. God looked for somebody that he could manifest his nature to. And you know, when the children of Israel came along, he had, he had a people that he could manifest his nature to. 
He had a people now, and I mean, when, when Moses and them, had, he had brought, God had brought the children of Israel out, and they got out there, and they had sinned and broke the commandments right to start with. Yeah. And God said, move the tabernacle outside the camp. Yeah. When he did, and then Moses said, God, i got to know who you are. i got to know your nature. And then when God told him who he was, then he said, hey, God, I know now that you're needing to manifest it. You're so heavy with forgiveness. You're so heavy with long-suffering. You are so overwhelmed with mercy. Now, here's a people right here that you brought out, and this is a good opportunity, to God, for you to reveal all of your nature to the nation of Israel. Now, God, have mercy on us and deliver us out of our sins. Let me just throw a little nugget in here. Just a little bitty nugget. We won't get sidetracked here too far. But the thing about it is, there's something going on in America that's really damaging the relationship between husbands and wives and wives and husbands. And that is the fact God put something... He put his nature on the inside of man when he created us. Man is a protector. He is a provider. He is a nurturer. God put that in man to take care of his wife and to love his wife and to cherish his wife and to protect her and all of this kind of stuff. Can you say amen? amen. I know y'all don't need this, but other crowd's not here, so you'll have to help me. Yes. And so what happens is, what happens is, if a woman lets the man know that she needs him, it puts a responsibility on him to provide that for her. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know if this is going to work. Amen. Amen. I should have taken that off from her for a day. But what I'm saying is let's just cut to the bone of this thing and, and just pop back. You know what a man needs? He needs the wife to need him. Yes, right. A husband needs his wife to need him. Right. It's damaging to a man. And I'm not against and I'm not against, you know, women having careers and, and being able to work and make it equal pay for equal work. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying though that if the woman lets a man think or lets a man know through her actions or behavior, look, I can take care of myself. I don't really need you. I can make it on my own. I buy my own clothes. I got my own car. I got my own job. And really truth, I don't have to have you, you know. Oh yeah. Do you know that that does something in the man? Because it makes him feel like I'm not needed here. When my first wife passed away, the thing that got to me the worst was my two girls had just been, I mean, they were grown and they had just gotten married and they had their own families. Now my wife had passed away and she didn't need me anymore. And so what I was, the situation that I was in is I felt like that nobody needed me anymore. Y'all with me? So that's, the, and, the, and, the, and the most damaging thing in the world is to be in the world and don't think anybody needs you. Or cares whether you're here or not. And you could go off the scene and nobody even miss you. God put something in us as human, which is His nature. God, who is our Father, then He has this on the inside of Him. He wants us to need Him. And mankind is trying to build a, 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 an environment down here, especially in America, where we can build our own nest egg and prove to God we don't need you. Come on, man. True. Whoa. But when God can look down on the earth and see somebody that says, God, I need you. Then God says, here am I. I've been looking for somebody that I can kill myself to. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, it was a great and glorious day when I came to Harris, Arkansas, and I met Barbara right here. And when I met Barbara, she let me know, I need you. Oh, I need to be needed. <laughs> Twelve years been going on. She still needs me, and I need to be needed. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell her, but I need her too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
the nature and the characteristics of God. God has all of this on the inside. And we're made in His image and in His likeness. That's what God wants in there, right? Yeah. Man had lost the image. He did not know what he was supposed to be. Now man knew what God was like, but man wasn't like that. And it was one thing to see and to, to know the image of God and then see his likeness and who he really is and then build him up of how great and wonderful God is in his likeness, but no human being on the face of the earth would like that. God did not want man in his image alone. He wanted man to be in his image and his likeness. So when God revealed his image to man or his likeness to man, then everybody on the earth said, Hey, I'm not that. I can't live up to that. There's no way I'll ever be like that. So what we wound up doing is only worshiping him which is great and wonderful, but that's not all God wanted. He did not create us just to worship Him because of who He is. That's part of it. Yes. But it's not just so we can worship Him because He's like that. Uh, all right. Come on. Let's go down to St. John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1 because man had fallen and was out of the image of God and sure was not in His likeness anymore. Praise the Lord. John chapter 1 and verse 4 through 14. Sister Barbara, if you read. In him was John life. 1, John chapter 1, St. John chapter 1, verse 4 through 14. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Notice the Word right there. And the Word was what? Made, made flesh. Yes. It was not born. The Word was not born flesh. The Word was what? Made. made flesh, alright? And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what we see right here, now we see the second Adam. And when Jesus was born, the Bible says that Jesus was born in the image of his Father God. Amen. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. So we have a man now on the earth, the Son of God, the Son of Man, that now he was born of God, and now we have one on the earth that is in the image of God. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that right? Amen. And he was the spitting image of his father. Yes. <laughs> I mean, just like God. Yeah. I mean, it's just in the image of God. But do you know that Jesus, when he was born, was not in the likeness of God? Right. He was not like his father at eight. He was not like his father at 12. He was not like his father at 25. It was not until he was 30 years of age. And when he was 30 years of age and, and he went to the river Jordan and while he was being baptized in the water, the Spirit of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of the Father, came and took up his abode on the inside of Jesus. And now... Jesus went around, and now not only is he the spitting image of the Father, but now he is the express yes. image of yes. the Father. Yes. Now that word image right there, the express image of the Father, is not the express form of the Father, it is the express <laughs> likeness of the Father. It's the express, express nature of the Father. He's the express 
characteristics of the Father. His very behavior is the Father manifested through Him. Yes. Y'all still with us? Yes. But Jesus didn't have that right to start with. This is the key phrase right here of the whole message tonight. Born in His image, but made in His likeness. Yes. If you want to title it tonight, it is born, he was born in his image, but he was made in his likeness. Jesus, the Bible plainly said that Jesus was made in the image of his Father by suffering. Yes. What he went through. Yes. What he, his life and growing up and, and the situation and the circumstances and the people that was around him, that made him in the likeness of his Father. Mm. We're going somewhere. Oh, I mean, go ahead and reach back and catch that seat belt and pull it around. Hold yourself here because you're going to need to hold yourself for a little while. And it was not that he himself could make himself. He had to have the surroundings just like a diamond. A diamond is not just compounds of elements that is laid out on the top of the ground. I mean, it takes the, the compounds put in an environment... Are you with us? Yes. And then it is the environment that makes that turn into a diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, he had all the elements in him. He was in the image of his father and all that. But it was not until he was put in the world and the situation and circumstances around him that caused him to his his human side to surrender and say, not my will, and though he had a right to express his own will in likeness. That's right. Are y'all still here? Yes. But he had to give up his will and rather than expressing what he thought and how he felt and what he thought and and uh, and, and, and his own opinions, and though he said, I don't do any of that, I wait and let the Father express his through me. Now we think that Jesus didn't have any problem whatsoever. I love the scriptures because it just clarifies everything. The Bible plainly says when the Pharisees were eating and chewing on him, he finally just got so riled. You saw him? The Bible plainly says in Psalms that were prophesied of Jesus that he minced, mused in his fire. That meant that there was something on the inside. He and he turned around to the disciples. I mean, he turned around to those Pharisees and he said, "Let me tell you something. I have many things I'd like to say to you, but I can only say that to the Father tells me." To say. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. Know that feeling. Yeah. So we're all in the same. <laughs> and no, we have a high priest. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of what our infirmity, what we go through, because he went through everything we went through, and we know, yet without sin, and God took that environment, and through that environment, he learned that it crucified his own will, and he yielded to the will of the Father. Isn't that right? So Jesus was born in his likeness, but he was what? Made in his image. Let me tell you something. The world, when Jesus came, the world did not need another prophet. That's right. They did not need another miracle worker. Right. They did not need another guru. Yeah. They needed to see and to know God for who God really was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus did not come on the earth in order to have power so he could cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, and show everybody that I'm the Son of God. The world needed deliverance and, and, and needed somebody that had the power, but they needed to know the nature and the very characteristics of God Himself. And Jesus came into the earth, and He came to be the very express image of the likeness or the very nature of His Father. What is that? The world needed love because it didn't have any. That's right. So Jesus came into the world that was full of hostility and hate yes. and rejection. Yes. But what he did, he chose not to get involved in that in retaliation and conflicts with hatred, jealousy, strife. That wasn't, mankind didn't need more of that at it. They needed something that they didn't have. Yeah. So what Jesus came to do, He came to let God through Him in, inject love into an ungodly hatred generation. Yeah. 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 
God. Yes. He came to his own, his own received him not. But as many as received them, to them gave he power to what? To become what? Sons of God. Sons of God. The world needed forgiveness. They didn't even want forgiveness. Didn't ask him to forgive. Right. But God said, look, I am so full of forgiveness, a world down there needs forgiveness. I, they don't ask me to forgive. They're not coming to me and falling on their face and asking me to forgive. But I've got so much forgiveness on the inside and mankind needs forgiveness. So I'm just going to send my son down there and I'm just going to pour out forgiveness. Forgive, 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 forgive. They treat him dirty, he just forgives them. They talk about it, he just loves them. And they persecute him, he heals them. Yeah. Come on. Wow. Yeah. We're going somewhere. Yeah. What the world needs now is what? Love. Love, but it ain't this. Come on. It's worldly love because the worldly love ain't heaven. Come on now. What the world needs now is God's love. That's right. Let me tell you something. The world today needs the love of God just as much as it did when Jesus came into the world and the world was full of hate. Envy and strife and malice and yeah. selfishness. Yeah. God sent the Son to reveal His love because, see, you can't have a crop of anything without planting something. Right. And God wanted a people on the earth that was in His image, but also was in His right. likeness. Yes. So Jesus came to show us the way. Jesus came to give up His will. And not to portray what he thought and his opinion and how he felt. He said, I didn't come to do that. But I came and let the, the nature and the glory of God be revealed through me. Yes, amen. The Bible says he was the express image of God's glory. Yes, what is that? He was the express image of the very nature and character of the invisible God. Yes. Man can't see God. No man has ever seen God. But I'll tell you one thing. Why? Because you can't see love. You can't see forgiveness. You can't see long suffering. You can't see forbearance. You can't see these characteristics that God is. But I'll tell you what. We need them anyway. You might be able to see them, but we need them. And that's what God said. His son, to give us something. Not that we can see, but what we need. On the inside. And I'll tell you what, no wonder the world, some of them hated him, rejected him. He hung on the cross. When he hung on the cross, they spit in his face. They plucked yeah. his beard. They mocked him and ridiculed him. Said, if you be the Son of God, come down. You know what? He said, no. I'm going to hang here to let you see the nature of God. Yeah. If I was like one of you, I'd come down all right. I'd snatch my arms off this thing. I'd come down here and show you a thing or two. I could wipe out a whole bunch of them. I could call a whole legion of angels right now and completely wipe out the human race. Yeah. Yeah. Bless God, that's what they needed. No. They didn't need that. They needed love. They needed forgiveness. They needed God's com compassion. They needed God's forbearance. They needed God's long suffering. And what God did through Jesus Christ, He hung on the cross. He said, I will not come down, but I'm going to stay here and let God's nature and His glory be manifested through me to the world that really needs it. Amen. The world don't want it, but they need it. How are they ever going to get it unless it's planted? Planted. Yeah. Jesus came into the world that had no love so the love of God could be planted in it. Forgiveness. And you know what he did? He planted that and as many as received him he planted his nature in them. He planted his likeness in them. No man is greater than his master. But he which is perfect or mature or developed shall be as his master. Like his master. Not in the image of him but like him. Let me tell you something. God didn't want just one man down here that he could manifest his likeness through that was in the likeness of God. God wanted a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what he said, he said, as many as received. A little bit warm in here. I think people come in. Trying to get drowsy. Can we stir something? Grab a fan out or something? <laughs> But what, I'll tell you what, just stand your feet just a minute. It's all right. Praise the Lord.
We're bringing it to a close, but God, the, the, the end is the powerful key. The end of this thing is the powerful key. The end is the powerful key. God wanted many. You got your Bibles, had you? Let's go to Romans. You can stand or be seated, whatever comes from you. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Hold on a minute. We're going somewhere, as Brother Dave said. Romans 8 and 16 and 18. Sister Barbara. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What Paul is saying right here is that God has called us to be children of God, and when you are born again, now you're back in, you're born in His likeness. Yeah. You're born in His likeness. Yeah. Have you ever seen a child try to become like their daddy in form? They can't do that, can they? Can a child make themselves conform to the image of their father? That comes through what? Birth. So we're born in God's image. Isn't that right? But he said that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And if we will what? suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. And then he says the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the what? Glory or the full nature or the very development or likeness of God that shall be revealed in us. Yes. Let me tell you something. The church has shallowed this thing. Yes. The church has brought it down. You just be a good church member and you pay your tithes and you be a pretty good moral person. You don't steal and you don't kill nobody and you haven't murdered anybody and you don't commit adultery unless it's uh, convenient and your wife is not good to you or your husband is not good to you and then that gives you a good excuse and you know we kind of live this churchy life and everything's going to be alright when Jesus comes. My Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews that he was the firstborn among what? Yeah. Many brothers. Then he did this that he might bring forth many sons unto what? Glory. glory. What is glory? Yeah. Nature. Yeah. The nature, the characteristics, or the likeness of God. So yeah. when we get saved, I tell you the first thing that's going to happen in our life, we're born in his image, but God starts immediately to make you in yeah. his likeness. Yeah. 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 That is a process. Make you look at your neighbor and shake their hand before they sit down and you sit down and say, God's making you into his likeness. You may be seated if you like. He's making you in his likeness. Yes. You are born in his image, but you are being what? Made. Made into his likeness. Yes. If you suffer, you're not going to be made into his likeness. Without going the same route that Jesus took. Yeah. If he had to suffer, we must also suffer with him. Yeah. Right. Amen. 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 Jesus paid it all. <laughs> he did for my being born in his image, but he did not pay the price for me to be made in his life. I've got to suffer some things to be made in his life. Yeah. 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 And it is through the furnace of affliction. Yes, it is. Yes. God help us. So when we are born into His likeness, the first thing God starts doing, He starts creating or adjusting or bringing us into this environment that is specially ordered just for you. Ooh. A furnace. A furnace of affliction. Yes. When you get saved, don't believe that crowd that says when you get saved, I mean everything just blessed and hunky dory from then on. My mama used to say. You're going to go through some things. Yeah. And the reason that we got to go through some, some things is because there's a nature on the inside of us that was brought about by the fall of man and Satan brought that in there and that nature is self-centeredness. Yeah. Yeah. And God starts immediately to break down selfishness. Yes. So God orchestrates our environment in order to start working on 
that self life. Yes, he does. <laughs> self centeredness. We have lived by the soul since the fall. Now the soul of man is your mind, and it is your will, and it is your emotions. Yes. When we got, when we were in the world, we strictly were manipulated and controlled by the devil by thoughts he put in our mind, and then he put desires in our flesh, and then he he got us to will ourselves to go his way. Right. Y'all still here? Amen. So we've went that way so long until when we get saved. Now when we're born in His image, then God starts changing the likeness and getting the likeness of Satan out of there. And the root cause of that likeness of Satan is selfishness. Amen. So therefore, God is going to put us in situations that selfishness is not going to be able to live. Right. Oh, it's getting quiet in here. Look how they look in the <laughs> But see, God's nature is on the inside of you. Is it not? Yes. Let's go now to Colossians. No, let, wait, 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 before we go there. Yeah, let's go to Colossians. Let's give a couple of scriptures and go to Colossians here. Colossians? We'll back up to those, Sister Barbara. Colossians chapter 3. In verse 1 through 14, Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 14, okay? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members. Read that, read that verse again. Wow. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are about the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put right, on... Let me stop right there for just a minute. All of these things he's telling us, now since we are Christians, the purpose and the plan of God is to start working on us to bring us into the image and the likeness, to bring us into the likeness of God. And when Jesus appears, we shall be... Like, like him, or in the same glory, or our very nature, and our characteristics, and our mannerism, and our behavior will be just like him. Now that's not going to happen in the rapture of the church. Right. It is a process of time that God is going to work on us, that when he appears, then we will already be like him. He's not going to change all of this in order to be like him because if that be the truth let's not go do nothing let's just wait till the rapture comes and then he's going to change all of us we'll be all like him then but he says if we suffer with him we'll come into glory he didn't say I'm going to make you into that glory when the rapture takes place I'm going to make you and conform you and do this right now during your Christian walk because the purpose of God is to bring us into his glory or his Likeness. Let's go to and say his likeness. His likeness. And then he tells us all the likeness that we had before we got saved. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. And then he turns around and he says, now these things were the way your nature was before you got saved. Now you must mortify those things. Yes. Right. Mortify, the root word for that is morphine. It is to nullify or to numb. <laughs> Do not allow these things to... to, to to work in our bodies and to rule in our bodies, we are to nullify these things. We're to be dead to them. Right. Dead to them. Yeah. Right. Like when that dentist goes in there and sticks that shot in there, you know, and give that shot in the in the jaw, what do we say? He's dead in that thing. What did he dead in it to? Pain. Pain. Yes. <laughs> we are to be dead to sin. We're to be dead to the yes. things of the world. We yes. are to mortify these things and not give ourselves to that nature because if we keep yielding ourselves to the nature that we have before we are saved, then what's the purpose in the whole thing? That's right. Listen to what he says here. Now finish that what God's doing in the nature of God. Mm, listen to how he tells us. He tells us how to do it here. But Verse now eight. you also put off all these. 
anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created you. Now, the, the amplified there, has anybody got an amplified? What does it say? And have clothed yourself with the new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remodeled, molded into fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge, after the image, the likeness of him who created you. The likeness. That word right there is 1604 in the Strong's Concordance reference of the Lexical Age, and it is not only, it's not just an image, but it is in the likeness. So what we're to do is we're, put on in the, we're putting on the new man, which is in, like Christ, and letting Christ's nature and His very uh, uh, characteristics and His likeness to be manifested through us. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Isn't that right? Go ahead now. Which is renewed in the knowledge after the likeness of Him that created Him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, in, against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of per perfection. All right. Perfectness. God's telling us what we must put on here. How many has been trying to do that and you're still falling short? <laughs> how in the world, saints of God, are we ever going to become in, how in the world are we ever going to come into being in the image, I mean the likeness of God? Church, church entity teaches us behavior. And watch your mouth. All of these are good. And they're part of it. But you can change your behavior. And try your best to behave like Jesus. And you're still going to fall short. That's right. <clears throat> you can quote every word that Jesus said out of your mouth. But that does not make you the word made flesh. <laughs> you may be the walking, or you may be a walking uh, a person that has the walking word in your mouth. You may be able to speak it, but that don't make you that. Amen. Let me tell you something. I believe in confession. I believe in taking the word of God, and God's word says I'm the redeemed of the Lord, and I say so. Amen. 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 But me saying so, does that make me redeemed? No. I was redeemed before I ever said so. That's right. Huh? Isn't that right? So me confessing the word all the time does not make me that. Right. Are y'all still here? Yes. Yes. What it is is God, me confessing the word does not make me that. Does not make me what the word says. That's part of it, but it'll never make me that. I could confess here until I'm 90 years old that I am a master sergeant in the army. Would I ever become a master sergeant? I might convince myself that I am, but I won't never be one. Y'all yeah. still here? Yeah. Yeah. So that is not the root of it. How in the world does God bring us, and it has got to be Him that does this, and He tells us that we're to do things, but see, how in the world are we ever going to do this? It's not something we do, but it's something God is doing in us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The Bible says, let me, let me back up just a little bit. God says in His Word, in Genesis, when God told Moses to go and offer up His son, His only son Isaac, and when, I, when Moses, uh, Moses, I mean Abraham, offered up Isaac, His son started to draw the knife back and take and offer up His son to God as a, as a sacrifice, God sent the angel and stepped in and said, Abraham, Abraham, stop right there. Yes. Then he turned and he said, I am Jehovah Jireh. Now we've taken that, and I'm telling you, we've had that interpreted. My God supplies all of my financial needs, and my, and you know, He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He provides me cars, He provides me money. That is not what that's talking about. Come on. Abraham didn't need no money. 
Right. So it wasn't, God wasn't saying, I'm here to give you money, Abraham. Amen. He, he didn't need no money right there, did he? What the truth of it is, that God is Jehovah Jireh, but what God went on, He explained that. He said, Abraham, what I require, I provide. Yes. Amen. Yeah. This is the key. Saints of God, it took me years wandering around in the darkness. And I didn't find this. God finally had just opened my eyes and showed me this by revelation. I would have never found this in my own self. But the key to this whole thing is if God wants me in His likeness, the only way I'll ever be in His likeness is for Him to provide that in me and through me. I can't ever be like God. <laughs> the church is filled with people struggling, straining, trying to conform themselves to be like God. And that is like a bunch of kids playing playhouse and making mud pies and calling them apple pies and steak and taking grass and mixing it together and calling it collard greens. It's play acting. The church is play acting. We can go in and say, well, the love of God is better about in my heart for the Holy Ghost, so I'm just going to love you. That's fine until that person really comes in and just cuts your throat and you stand and bleed to death. Then all of a sudden, that I just love you. It just goes somewhere. That's the truth. <laughs> but see, God's love never fails. Yeah. That's right. So this love the church is trying to project to one another is not. It's just humans trying their best to make themselves like God and trying to portray, oh, I'm just like God. I just love you. And I'll tell you what, you just done that, I just forgive you. And then 10 years, we tell everybody about it. I, I, I just don't hold anything in my heart now. I forgave them. Yeah? That is the counterfeit. That is the shallowness. That's man's effort trying to be like God. There is no shortcut to this thing. Satan cannot offer you to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil so you can become like God. Man can never become like God. It takes God on the inside of us for Him to protect His own nature. We must become the express image of God and the express nature of God through us. Man. Romans chapter 5. Can I have something more minutes? Yeah. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. This, how are you going to do this, God? Let me tell you something. If you and I would just give ourselves into God's hands, He knows how to do it. <laughs> He's not looking for me to produce it. He's looking for me to come and give myself to Him and say, God, I can't produce your nature. I can't. The only thing I can come up with was a good old church member. And the best I can produce is just, you know, just doing the best you can. Hope that's enough, God. God said, no, that's not enough. I'm not looking for you to do the best you can. God is not looking for the ultimate of man's uh, uh, abilities or trying to do it himself. He's looking for availability for somebody to kill themselves and let God do work in us and through us until He brings us into the glory of the Son. God, look up and say, God knows how to do it. <laughs> chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 verse 3 for time's sake and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us mm. Mm. Paul said, I, not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation, what? Patience is, the, is, is part of the nature of God. Yes, long suffering. Long suffering is part of the nature of God. Forgiveness is part of the nature of God. Yes. Oh, my. Keep that seatbelt on. God, in the new covenant, God says, I will come and I will live in you and I will walk in you and I will manifest myself through you. 
So God, who is spirit, has no helios on the inside of me. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're a Christian and you've accepted Jesus Christ, have no chief God was in Christ, so if you've got Christ in you, you've got God in you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 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 And the love of God is in us so much until God needs some way to express it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But guess who God chooses to express it to? The unlovable. <laughs> that one that you can't tolerate. <laughs> that one that just gets on your nerves. <laughs> guess what? God put you right there. Right by that one. And everything within you wants to rise up and do something about this situation. Yes. yes. No patience. <laughs> now God preached this to me first, so I'm here to unload on y'all. I can't care about that by myself. <laughs> and the Lord says, see, the world needs what? Love. Love. Who needs it the worst? The unlovable. The unlovable. Yes. Me. Yes. Amen. We went over there, me and Brother Dave's son went over there to get a, 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 a butane bottle filled up at this place. And we got over there, and, and when we drove up in the yard, the lady was outside. She went inside the office and slammed the door. And, and David, Dave, Brother Dave's son, told me, he said, I want you to meet somebody. He said, now this is a character. <laughs> and he told me this before we got over there. And uh, we pulled up there and that woman slammed the door and I looked, I was sitting in the van and I was looking and I mean she had notes pasted in the windows. And I mean bulletins all over the place. I mean, you couldn't hardly see the building for her notes all over the place. We are open to 4.30, but we do not fill bottles after 4 o'clock. And we do not have to explain to anyone our closing or opening hours. In other words, we don't care if you do business here or not. <laughs> and it makes her mad if you show up to give her some business. <laughs> but you can tell right there she was not the owner of the place, right? <laughs> but when we got there, that spirit was so strong, she finally, I went on around to the back. She went inside and slammed the door. Of course, it was not my butane bottle, thank the Lord. So I just let David go in there and tell the lady that we needed some gas in the bottle and it was 4 o'clock right then. <laughs> That's why she's mad. And so she came out there and she was dropping and mumbling under breath and reaching down the key and opening the door and gate and then a big old note on the gate where you're going behind this fence. It said, we do not lift the bottles. <laughs> and we do not fill bottles with any rust on them. Your Bible must be of the latest date of so-and-so. Well, it took me 30 minutes to read all the sign. By then, she was closed. <laughs> I'm trying to hurry. So I, I asked her, uh, I said, would you like me to put the, the, the bottle over there? And she said, yeah, but i got to move it first. She reached and grabbed the hold of the little bottle, you know, moved it aside. Well, this thing ain't even empty. I said, I know it's not quite totally empty, but I said, we would like to top it off. <laughs> Go ahead and just top it. Well, it's going to cost you the same thing. <laughs> Don't matter. Go ahead and get it. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Well, we'll pay you for the bull. It's going to cost you the same. We'll fill it up. And you're same thing. I don't care what it is. So she put two gallons in there, two pounds in there. It's supposed to be five. She cut the thing off. It wasn't half full. She could hand it back to him and charge the full amount. I just reached and got it, and man, I tell you, the spirit in that place, everything in Ron Thomas wanted to tell her, excuse me for being here, okay? I'm sorry I showed up, and if you'll just feel that thing, I'll never be back here no more. <laughs> I know none of y'all would have done that. You just <laughs> and I started back to the car. And everything in me was just like this. <laughs> I wanted 
I was like Jesus. I had many things I'd like to say that. <laughs> I just bit my lip and didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. I got in the car and I sat there and thanked the Lord I didn't have to go in the office and David took care of the bill. It was his butane model. He took care of the bill. I sat in the car. I said, Lord, that woman is possessed. <laughs> she was. She was totally possessed. <laughs> David came back out there and he said, Well, what do you think? I said, If I've ever met a woman, it was a junkyard dog. <laughs> Mean is a junkyard dog. I say you have one with this deal. But then it wasn't but two or three days after this, the Lord gave me this message. The Lord said, you know what? If anybody in this whole county needs to see and to witness the love of God. It's her. She's probably never had love manifested to her in her life. Right. Mm -hmm. You abuse somebody. You curse them enough. You tell them they're sorry. You tell them they're low down. You tell them they ain't fit for nothing. And you know what? They'll start biting you. Yeah. You slap a dog around or a cat or anything else. Yeah. But this was a human being. But you know, some people are treated like animals. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lord let me know. So this woman has been abused. She's been hurt and she's been wounded. And that's the reason you touch her and all this poison comes out. But you know what she needs? She don't need more of the same. She needs you to pray and ask God to manifest His love to her. How is God ever going to manifest Himself to the world? He's not going to do it by us coming to church and praying for God to reveal your love to the world. Guess what? He's going to do it through us. That's it. How's God ever going to manifest His forgiveness to the world except through us? Saints of God, what we go through, the sufferings, the, 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 the tribulations of this present time, what we're going through, and the environment that you're in, and that person that you're connected to, and that neighbor that you're joined up with, and that person at work that is on your case all the time. If you can manifest your own flesh and selfish nature back and let them know a thing or two, or else you can say, Lord, you brought me into this situation for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And it is so that you can work your nature through me. Yes. Lord, let them see Christ through me and not let them see me. Amen. Right, amen. Somehow, yes. help me, Lord, to let them see you yes. through me. What is God like? He's love. What is God like? He's patient. Yes. He's patient. How in the world is ever the world ever going to see the nature of God's patience through us. You know what patience really means? It means to persevere. How in the world are we ever going to let God's nature, which is patience, be manifested through us if there's nothing out there that we're having to manifest the patience and persevere? Be persistent until they see God says right here in Colossians, He said that we might manifest the long-suffering of God. How in the world is, is the world ever going to see long-suffering if we're short-tempered with them? How are they ever going to see the nature or the likeness of God through the church if we don't suffer? Long-suffering is nothing more than to suffer long. Yeah. Suffer long. Yes. Sister Carolyn added, and is what? Kind. <laughs> It's not, yeah, bless God, I'm suffering. <laughs> I put up you about all I can put up with. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that is not allowing the nature of Jesus Christ or the nature of God to be manifested through us if I'm just suffering. But if I'm suffering long and I'm also kind while I'm suffering, it's not my kindness, but it's His. See, what we need to realize is I can't do this. The Bible says love them that despite the use. Pray for them. Yeah. Love your enemies. Pray for them that what? Despite the use. Why? I asked Barbara to read this right here, this thing right here. 
Now this, I think I saw this out in the foyer a long time ago, but I've had a copy of this a good while too. And it's called what? A word to my enemies. Just listen with your heart just a minute. And really concentrate, because this is the key right here, and we're closing with this. My beloved enemy, you are not really my enemies at all. In reality, you are some of the best friends I have. <coughs> you who have lied about me and about this ministry, who have tried to destroy people's faith and confidence in me, who have spread false and damaging rumors about my life and teachings. Through your efforts, there has been a work of grace wrought in this heart of mine that could never have happened without you. My friends have been many and loyal and faithful to stand with me in many hours of trial and need. They have been strength to my weakness, added joy to my heart in times of sorrow, and have girded up my faith amidst raging doubts. They have brought me before the throne of grace innumerable times in their seasons of prayer. I could not have continued long in this spiritual conflict without these wonderful friends. But believe me, I speak in sincerity and truth. There can be no perfection in the lives of God's elect without the chastising work of a real enemy. For when a bitter, vicious person begins to do all they can to destroy me and my work for God, then there is a work done that brings out all the wrong and evil attitudes and spirits that lie and deeply rooted in my heart. When a friend extols all my good virtues and praises me from their heart of true friendship, I feel nothing but love for them. But when I hear of an enemy who has unjustly brought shame upon me, there rises up a spirit of defending myself and a spirit of righteous indignation to refute the enemy. It is then that the precious Holy Spirit does his office work and reveals to me the wrongness of my own spirit. <coughs> I see in me then the things I did not know were there before. With repenting and sorrow, I cry out to God, and he delivers me from that which I have seen in my life. It was hidden, lying dormant until you, until you, my beloved enemy, brought it to light with your crucifying process. The prophets of old would never have had the glory of being stoned for the word of God, and no martyr's crown could ever have been won by the early Christians without real enemies. You see, I cannot crucify myself, and friends will not do it. So it takes you, my enemy, to bring me to the cross. And to the cross I must come, if ever I am to come to the glory of perfection. But I have much progress yet to make before coming to the Im image of my lovely Jesus. There is so much I must yet learn. And my enemy, and as my enemy, you are teaching me. I have learned that the road to glory is by way of the cross. Without you, I would not have found the way. Someone had to crucify my Jesus, not his friends, not his disciples, and he could not do it himself. So Satan and the princes of this world stirred up hatred in the hearts of his enemies, and the work was done. Had they known that they were bringing him into his glory, and bringing about the salvation of lost mankind, they would not have done it. And I'm sure that if you knew the good your efforts are working out in my life, you would not want to help me so much. But the work is being done, and I have learned to love you because of it. Love thy enemies, he said, and I wondered how I could do it. But you have taught me, for because of you I have grown in God, increased in his grace, and partaken of his divine nature. Also because of you have been also because of you many have been turned away and refused to hear the truths imparted into this vessel. Their ears have been filled with lies, and no doubt they thought that no good thing could possibly come from such a one. But even here I have seen the hand of God. For those who have had ears to hear the voice of the Spirit have not believed the lies you have told them. And they have opened their hearts to the message for these last days. Thus God has weeded out the chaff from the wheat, and he is in the process of separating his own unto himself. All things are working together. So, my friends, for in reality I have no enemies in flesh and blood. 
Your work has been sharp and cutting, and many times I was hurt and wounded deeply. But out of these trying experiences, I have come forth a better Christian, and further on my way to being an overcomer. I doubt that you will receive any rewards for your lies and your efforts to receive destroy me, for woe unto them through whom these offenses come. But I want you to know that though your loss may be great in the day of judgment, I love you and appreciate the ministry you have had in perfecting this life of mine. Now just a word to all who have read this. I trust that you have understood that this word has not been applicable to me only, but should apply as well to all of us, dear children. May the Spirit speak to your heart and open your eyes to this great truth, that without chastisement and the work of enemies, we can never come into full sonship. And when we see how much our persecutions and afflictions mean to us in maturing our spirits and bringing us into his image, then we can truly love our enemies and bless them that curse us. Praise God for his marvelous plan. And remember, all the enemy can destroy in the fires of persecution is hay, wood, and stubble. And all they will melt and bring into his image is the gold, silver, and precious stones. So let us be willing to burn that which will burn, that those things which will not burn may stand forever. That's a, that's a writing that Bill Britton made. He first got first started giving the revelation of God's people coming into maturity, and he was persecuted by the churches severely for the message. And the Lord gave him that. And I'll close with this, but I can never read the last part, <coughs> last five chapters of Genesis about the, the life of Joseph without weeping and crying. Because Joseph's brothers, Joseph had a dream, and those dreams in those dreams, he had more than one. In those dreams, God showed him that he was going to make him a leader. He was going to put him in a position of leadership. But Joseph was not ready for that leadership. So what God started doing is God started making him and developing him into that that he needed to be before he could ever become in that leadership position. So his brothers moved with envy, sold him. And they tried and thought about killing him, and then they rejected him and threw him in a pit, and then they took him up and sold him. Then he wound up in Egypt and in Potiphar's house as a slave, as a servant of slave. He was there for a while, and rather than ruling, he was being ruled over. <coughs> Then he gained a little bit there and it looked like he was going to, you know, now God's promoting me and from there he was lying on and he was doing what was right but he suffered for that which is right. Let me tell you something, because you're a Christian and you do the right thing does not mean that you're not going to suffer for it. In fact, we will suffer for righteousness' sake. You will be hated by people because you're a Christian. The Bible says in Matthew 24, Jesus said that you'll be hated of all nations. And people will betray you, especially in the last days. And they went through, Joseph went through this. And then he was lied on, cast into prison, was left there in that dungeon. And let me tell you something, the dungeons back then was nothing like our jails today. Rat infested, foggy, muggy, wet, damp. He was there for two years. Finally, God had made, made and developed him and brought about the, the nature and the characteristics inside of Joseph that made him prepared for what God had for him. Then when he was lifted up and made and put uh, second only to Pharaoh, then he, his brothers came. You know the story well. His brothers came. And then when, then when Jacob died, his brothers came to him because they thought now he's going to get vengeance on us. Mm -hmm. He's going to kill us all now since, since our father's dead. Jacob would have protected us, but now our father Jacob's gone with him. 
Joseph would kill us all. So they came and fell at Joseph's feet, begging for mercy and said, you know, we'll become your servant. We'll be your slaves. And you know what? The work was done in Joseph that he turned to them. And in Genesis 50, don't turn there if you will for time's sake, but Genesis 50, 18 through 20. Joseph was talking to his brothers and he said, You thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Amen. What people mean for harm and against you is evil. If we, this is the reason that so many people quitting and giving up and leaving is because they expect God to bless our path and bathe our steps in butter and just, you know, take away all conflict. But see, absent from conflict and absent from tribulation, absent from suffering, that will never, the nature of God will never be developed in us. That's right. Because we have another nature there that must be brought down, that must be crucified, that must be nailed to the cross, that must be brought under subjection. And God surrounds us with circumstances and situations that puts us in those areas. Let me tell you something. Anybody can be real kind and sweet in church. But what about when we're home and we're in a family environment and our mate disagrees with us? We rise up in anger against that and we manifest everything except love and long-suffering and patience. God puts us with that mate. And husbands, let me share something with you. We are supposed to be the express image of our Father God to our wives. Even as Christ loved us and gave up His life for us, even so we as men should lose our desires and will in order to minister to our wives. Well, I didn't get a whole bunch of amen. Amen. But wives, you should love your husband and respect him. And you know what? God puts us in situations. And that mate may be sandpaper against you. That mate may grind on your nerves. You may be having the hardest time in the world staying with that mate or that person. But let me tell you something. God is working a work. He will work a work in you through that situation if you'll allow him to. When, when anger rises up and frustration rises up and you want to express the hostility that's on the inside that you feel, if you will back off and go hide yourself in the closet and say, God, this is what I'm wanting to project, but I want you to project your nature in this. I can't do it, God, but I need you to do it through me. And if we'll submit ourselves unto God and, and humble ourselves before God, then heaven of God will manifest it through us. He'll manifest His nature through us. Yes. The Bible says, blessed to the meek. Blessed, oh, Jesus said, blessed to the meek. I wrote this down. That word meek right there is accepting all of God's dealings as good and not resisting them. We're blessed when we recognize that all things are working together for the good. For them that are called and those that love the Lord. In your negative environment, in that hostility at work, in that situation you're in, in that environment of, of needing finances and going through the struggles of paying bills and all this, this is nothing more than an opportunity to break down your own ability to reason things out and figure out how you're going to make it and how you're going to make ends meet. God is trying to break that down to get you to trust and look to Him in the old thing. Yes. That situation you're in in other areas of your life is nothing more than ordained situation for God to manifest Himself to you in that situation. Mm -hmm. And you know, He's the answer to every situation. Yes. Stand your feet if you will. Mm -hmm. You know who your best friend is? Your enemy. Your best friend is your enemy. Because your friend does not bring a change in you. It's that enemy that causes a change. And the Lord, as I was praying today, it just came up in my spirit. I said, God, 
the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being, I believe, would be to live his whole life and go through all the things that we go through and the situation and the circumstances and everything else and get to the end and we've not allowed God to change us. We've just resented everything that came out of us. Right. 